Hi, I'm Jack Barnes, President and CEO of People's United Bank. I'm here on Audubon Street in New Haven, a vibrant cultural center. People's United Bank is proud to support the communities where we live and work. That's why we're supporting CPTV and the many Connecticut cultural treasures they will be featuring over the coming months. Look for stories each week featuring a cultural treasure in your neighborhood. Creative expression can be defined, formalized, and even categorized. But just as important, the arts and culture can surprise us and make us feel things we never expected. And what might be hard to understand or even explain, creativity gets the message across. It just speaks to us. Hi, I'm Edwards Vicky, and welcome to another episode of Connecticut's Cultural Treasures. Today, we'll listen and learn about a Native American community that embraces creativity and storytelling. We'll see how science and sea life communicate together. We'll meet an industrialist who taught his community by gathering works of culture and art from around the world. And we'll see the Warner Theater's community mission in creative action. The world's largest Native American museum is right here in Connecticut. The Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center takes visitors on a journey through time, dating back 18,000 years to the present day. It's an adventure that weaves both natural history and Native American history together in an immersive experience. The Lifelike Village is amazing for people. You're stepping back hundreds of years, so you feel the heat, you smell the fire burning, you hear the noises of the, the animals around the village, and um, you actually get to hear some of the conversations between the uh, life casts. The lifelike casts were constructed from Native people across the United States, and you see them throughout the museum. A ride down into the beginning of the Ice Age starts the journey with frigid cold waters and a peek into how the landscape was formed. Here you see the first humans and animals that populated the region. In the aftermath of a successful hunt, members of this ancient hunting group have begun to butcher the fallen caribou. We provide as much information as we can to the public, but it's layered. So someone can go through this museum two or three hours, and we've had actually some people who have gone through every exhibit, read every piece of text, you know, experienced all the audio, the films, and it's three full days. One of the ways the museum tries to bring you closer to nature is by incorporating nature whenever they can, which is why they have this observation deck, which is 18 stories high and overlooks the Connecticut Hills. One of the main permanent exhibits includes a massive Pequot village. Everything in it, from the tools to the clothing to the bark on the trees, is made by a native person in the United States. It's pretty authentic, and it had a, a great perspective of, of integrating research, archaeology, and sort of native perspective, craftspeople who had really brought all this to life. The museum is configured chronologically. In this 16th century coastal Pequot village, you can see 12 wigwams and life-size figures showing what everyday life was like, cooking, making tools, hunting. Here visitors go from pre-European contact to post-contact, where you see evidence of disease and war, as in this Medicine Man exhibit. Throughout your visit here, you can take a break in any of the small theaters we have the tool theater where you can go in and learn about how tools were made hundreds of years ago and how they compare to the tools of today. Kimberly Shockley is a tribal member and works at the museum. It's, it's important to me because we're, we're dispelling stereotypes and we're teaching children about diversity and that the Native people still are here today and they're not going anywhere. We're a thriving people and we're survivors. So um, it's really important for our people to be able to tell our story. 
probably one of the most remarkable things about this museum, and it underscores the, um, the philosophy of the tribe, is they're trying to give you the information to make your own decisions about the past. Within this space is an active laboratory. The tribe supports a wide range of research in colonial, native, and African history and archaeology. We look at the diameter. Um, we look to see if uh, there's any marks that might indicate they're modern. Here, musket balls unearthed from nearby battlefields reveal a window into the past. We're looking at sort of the evolution of, of diplomacy, relationships, tactics, use of weapons as well. And it's provided us pretty interesting insights on both the colonial world in Connecticut as well as the native world. Even though it's been more than a decade since the museum opened, the exhibits you see here are constantly evolving, reinforced by new research that is carried out here. The museum serves as a caretaker of the culture, giving those who come here a renewed sense of Native America and of a thriving culture, making the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center a must-see Connecticut cultural treasure. I am not influenced by the expectation of promotion or pecuniary reward. I wish to be useful and every kind of service necessary for the public good becomes honorable by being necessary. With these words, Captain Nathan Hale embarked on a dangerous mission during the darkest hour of the American Revolution. A British invasionary force of 32,000 soldiers had landed in New York. The Continental Army was small, poorly equipped, and inexperienced. General George Washington needed information about the enemy's movement and strength. Nathan Hale's mission for General Washington was unsuccessful. Hale was hanged as a spy by the British at the age of 21. But he gave espionage and the cause of freedom its first martyr and patriot. He embodied the character, self-sacrifice, and valor that gave the patriot cause virtue and honor. Coventry, Connecticut is the place Nathan Hale called home. The Nathan Hale homestead is where he and his nine brothers and sisters worked, played, worshipped, and discovered the inner fire that led them to take up arms in the birthing of a new nation. The Nathan Hale Homestead is a 17-acre property owned by Connecticut Landmarks. The Nathan Hale Homestead is unique because of its intact Revolutionary War period landscape and beautiful preserved setting because it's surrounded by the 1,500-acre Nathan Hale State Forest. There's a plaque outside that marks the site of the original house in which Nathan was born and raised. And currently at the property is the home constructed by his family between 1775 and 1776. After graduating from Yale College, Nathan Hale taught school in Connecticut. Nathan was a school teacher in both New London and Haddam, Connecticut. The schoolhouses still remain to this day. Then he enrolled in the Continental Army. Nathan's father, Deacon Richard Hale, was a prosperous livestock farmer supplying food to the Continental Army. Six of the Hale family's eight sons served in the Patriot Army. Today, the Georgian-style home is interpreted to the period after the American Revolution, when two generations of the family occupied two separate parts of this large house. The house has two parlors, both formal and fashionable, this one for Deacon Hale and his wife. The adjoining parlor used by Nathan's brother John and his wife Sarah is more to the period of 1800, reflecting their youth in keeping up with the times. One of the most interesting rooms in the house is known as the Judgment Room. It was here that Deacon Hale and his son John held court for the community as justices of the peace. John's desk is one of the most important family heirlooms in the house. The fancy grain-painted paneled walls were high styling for the 1770s. This is a room that bespeaks a prosperous family of high aspiration and achievement. Agriculture was at the heart of the colonial economy. This seemingly isolated location was actually on the main road that connected Hartford with the shipping port of Norwich. Livestock, produce and goods on ox carts passed by daily. 
The Nathan Hale homestead passed out of the Hale family in the 1820s, but the house remained virtually intact. In the early 20th century, the homestead was saved by the renowned Connecticut preservationist George Dudley Seymour, who also commissioned a statue of Nathan Hale that has pride of place at the center of Yale University's historic Old College Quadrangle. Today, the Nathan Hale Homestead has a hands-on living history approach to the visitor experience. The homestead features a variety of hands-on demonstrations, including hearth cooking, where uh, folks can taste hasty pudding, and spinning, and smell tea, and smell herbs. You can try on clothes. The site also features original Hale barns, a kitchen, garden at the back of the homestead. And the stone wall surrounded Hale Garden, which we now use as our flag field for various programs and events. This room is a shrine to Nathan Hale with exhibits that tell the story of his youth, his patriotism, and his service in the spy corps, including statues, souvenirs, coins, medals, and a U.S. stamp in his image. In 2012, a new statue of Nathan Hale was erected in Coventry as part of his hometown's 300th anniversary celebration. Nathan Hale's legacy is certainly strong uh, in Connecticut. There are many statues of him. There are schools named after him in Connecticut as well as throughout the country. Agriculture is still an essential part of the Hale homestead experience. We honor that legacy by hosting an annual farm-to-table event called Dinner at the Homestead and a weekly farmer's market throughout the summer and fall seasons. In the nearby Nathan Hale Cemetery, the Hale family is buried near a monument honoring Nathan Hale, where his famous last words are carved in stone. Nathan Hale's character was shaped by the rocks and rhythms and Puritan values of this small upland community in eastern Connecticut. Its beauty is matched by its isolation and serenity. It is here at the Nathan Hale Homestead that you feel like you can travel back through time and connect with the spirit of early America in a place that produced one of our greatest national heroes, Nathan Hale. When you come to the Ocean Exploration Center here at Mystic, it's a gateway to the real world. This is the underwater world that only Dr. Robert Ballard and his crew have seen until now. These modern day explorers are also scientists, engineers, and students. Together, they're unlocking secrets from the ocean floor. What's really wonderful about what we do is when we find something we've never seen before or find something that's been lost for a long, long time, whether it's the Titanic or the ancient shipwrecks we're finding right now, it's Dr. Ballard's most famous find, the Titanic, which continues to capture imaginations. People have heard about the Titanic, and this is really an opportunity for people to get up close and personal with some of the things that were found and with information about the Titanic and maybe help them to better understand what really did happen when the Titanic sank. Today, 100 years after the ship's fateful journey, the man who found the iconic ship insists there's more to learn. We want you to participate in that moment of discovery. It's possible here at the new Ocean Exploration Center at Mystic Aquarium. The center was a longtime dream of Dr. Ballard's, brought to life with help of a former Disney Imagineer and a $1 million donation from United Technologies. So our job as innovators and creative people is to prove it can be done. The main exhibit takes visitors more than 12,000 feet below to encounter an iceberg, replicas of ship artifacts, and glimpse never before seen images from Dr. Ballard's private archive. Sometimes I think the reaction of the children is great because they know more than their parents do. The youngsters will come in and say, Oh, I remember seeing that on television. I saw those pictures of the Titanic sinking. Visitors are immersed in history and the innovative technology which made discovering the Titanic possible. Overhead, there is a floating ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, similar to the one Ballard used to track the Titanic. Dr. Stephen Cohn, president of the Sea Research Foundation at Mystic Aquarium, explains the appeal. 
Well, there are a lot of interactive components uh, in the Titanic exhibit. Well, I think what's really neat is this type of thing that the kids can push and, and that then we can go downstairs and you can listen and talk to one another. Thanks to touch screens, parents and kids can also take their own journeys hunting for clues along a sea bed. We're going to play a fun game, okay? So put down your circle. Or flipping through the ship's blueprints. It's hands-on and high-tech. This is exactly what kids are doing, but we're using it to hook them on STEM education. It's that passion for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math that Dr. Ballard hopes will inspire the next generation of innovators, scientists, and explorers. Math is the most popular class in America in the fourth grade, least popular by the tenth grade. Our job is to keep that flame of curiosity burning. So hi guys and welcome to the Nautilus Live Theater here. In this the is another way. The Nautilus Live Theater connects visitors to real-time deep sea exploration and discovery. Let's pull up our two remotely operated vehicles, our ROVs, a little earlier today. They Live is everything. Live is what really gets people's attention. Think of it as Alice's looking glass through which you enter to join the real world. Right behind me right now is the real world. Scientists conduct research in the field, then act as reporters offering live updates, beamed back to the theater. Nautilus arrived at the Anaximander Seamounts early this morning and immediately put Hercules and Argus in the water. Whenever our ship, the uh, Nautilus, is out at sea, uh, people can follow it 24 hours a day uh, and interact with the crew. Can you give us a little update on what's been going on the last 24 hours or so? What's been going on the last 24 hours or so? Absolutely. We did our first dive of this leg of the journey, and we've been diving mostly around 2,300 meters today. The core samples actually have some bubbles coming up from them, which indicate that there's some methane activity there, which probably indicates that those are active areas. And six times a day, we're doing live shows. We have 85 to 90 percent attendance. It's all part of an effort by Dr. Ballard and the team at Mystic Aquarium to educate and entertain. What's your favorite part, Sam? The stingrays. Sam really likes the stingrays. It's really nice. Um, it's definitely more personal than any other aquarium that we've been to. Actually, it's beautiful. And I would recommend it to everybody because it's something to do in the winter, you know, when you can go outside and have fresh air and see the animals and come inside and relax. A lot of people see just an aquarium, and we're a lot more than an aquarium. We're a major international uh, learning institution and, uh, and research institution. This is the focus of America's Ocean Exploration Program. A focus that's inspiring the next generation of great explorers right here in Connecticut. In 1886, William Albert Slater, the son of a wealthy Norwich textile industrialist, offered to memorialize his father, John Fox Slater, with a new building for Norwich Free Academy in Norwich, Connecticut. Renowned architect Stephen Earle designed this masterpiece in the Romanesque Revival style. The Slater Memorial Museum has served as a cultural hub for the Norwich community ever since. William Slater, an alumnus of Norwich Free Academy and Harvard, believed that travel, theater, music, and art were essential ingredients of a well-rounded life and education. Today, the Slater Museum is one of the most unique art museums in America. It reveals what industrial age Americans had in mind when they created our first art museums. William Slater embarked on the Grand Tour with his family in 1894 on board his 232-foot yacht with all the comforts of home. William and Ellen Slater and their children Eleanor and Willie went on the Grand Tour in 1894 and 95 on their private yacht Eleanor. And they traveled out of New London, went all the way around the world to experience the great museums and to have an adventure at sea, and it was not uncommon in the 19th century for people of means to do this. The Grand Tour exhibition at the Slater Museum represents objects that the Slaters viewed and brought back, and these were commonly exhibited in the homes of the wealthy in Norwich and all around the New England area at that time. The Slater Museum is rare among art museums in being part of Norwich Free Academy, the city's high school.
Robert Porter Keep, the school's principal, was a former consul to Greece and classics scholar. He collaborated with William Slater to acquire a collection of reproductions of famous classical and Renaissance sculpture. We have 127 casts of ancient sculpture on display in the museum, all of which were taken from molds from the originals. In the 17th century, German classicists and scholars felt that their students should view the most beautiful objects, and they felt the most beautiful objects were classical sculpture, and they felt if they couldn't see the original, the best alternative was to see a perfect copy of it. The main art gallery is one of the most picturesque museum spaces in America. It is a shrine to Greek mythology and is one of the largest intact displays of classical casts in the United States. The museum has also amassed an exceptional collection of art, decorative arts, and inventions made in Norwich. Norwich was the birthplace of the Connecticut clockmaking industry. Local cabinet makers produced chests and chairs prized by museums nationwide. Norwich was home to some of New England's largest textile mills and factories that produced firearms, cast iron stoves, and products associated with the maritime trade, including the bomb lance gun that revolutionized the whaling industry. Norwich was also home to professional artists like portrait painter Alexander Emmons and John Dennison Crocker. Their work is also featured at the museum. John Dennison Crocker documented life in Norwich at a time when it was becoming from the agrarian into an industrial center. And he painted not only scenes around him, but scenes of history. And that is the case with his capture of Miantonomo. The Norwich Free Academy also has an art school providing instruction to generations of students and employing artist teachers like Ozias Dodge, an innovative printmaker whose scenes of Norwich reveal a keen eye and a mastery of printmaking. One of the focuses of the Slater Museum is Connecticut artists throughout time, but we also have collections of Asian objects, African objects, and European objects, which help the public and our students understand the world around them. The Slater Museum is startling in its originality and sense of time travel. Picturesque and eclectic, it is a place where art, architecture, and history meet for the delight of Connecticut residents, visitors, students, and artists. So much to say, not just today, but all By listening to its community and acknowledging that need for self-expression, collective creativity, and a place to call their cultural home. The Warner Theater in Torrington has become the shining star of the performing arts in Connecticut's northwest corner. Because anything is possible, there's a future and it's here. But the star quality is the fact that anyone can walk in off the street and say, you know, I've always wanted to, I've sung this in the shower for 30 years and I really want to do it on stage. And you can, and that's the thing that's wonderful about this place. Built by the Warner Brothers Studios at the height of the Great Depression, this lavish 1800-seat movie palace gave this small town community a big time appetite for entertainment and culture. The design of this place dictates a formality which has an effect on the audience, on the patrons. They come in and they think, we're going to the Warner tonight, and maybe we ought to not wear jeans. Maybe we ought to dress, dress up a little bit, and they, and they do. The Warner shouldn't be here in Torrington, Connecticut. Um, you know, in 1931, when they put it here, they, the Warner Brothers had reasons. The makeup of the community was closer to a demographic they were looking to try to test films on and things like that. It's here in the northwest corner, and I think it's something that the community has really seen as special. Today, that early era passion for movies has given way to live performing arts. And the Warner has evolved into one of the state's most active theaters, offering over 170 events each year, including concert tours, big names in comedy, and cultural performances. There's a city that's rising around you. But creative programming at the Warner 
isn't just about those star attractions. For nearly 25 years, the theater's own Warner Stage Company has been the real link between the community and the heart of the Warner experience. There's a passion in people. And sitting at behind a desk as an accountant or, or what that daytime career may be, you're always looking for an outlet or something to kind of, a little spark, to add a little spark to what you do. And we make this accessible to everybody. And whether it's front and center or behind the scenes, the Warner stage welcomes its community with open arms to experience the theater and its transformational power. It's that moment where you can be free, where you can be emotionally free, that absolutely everyone needs. That's where we succeed as a community theater. With over 1,200 volunteers, the community may be the real star keeping watch over the Warner Theater. In fact, when the building faced demolition in the early 1980s, it was the community who rallied to reopen the doors, change history, and relight the Warner Star. That's our beacon. This was the impossible dream. This would have been a parking lot, but it's not. And it's the home of the Warner Stage Company. Over the last decade, the community has helped to raise over $17 million for renovations and expansion, which has led to a second studio theater, gallery space, and the Center for Arts Education. Performing arts education is an area that tends to foster acceptance of every student's strengths, opportunities for growth, and even the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. I and mean, we celebrate those here. Here in Torrington, the Warner Theater keeps proving the arts are meant to inspire us and enhance the quality of community life for all ages. The Warner is a living, breathing thing. It's people. It's a community. Our cultural treasures have the potential to speak to us, to teach us, to show us something new. It's a conversation that we think is definitely worthwhile. Thanks for letting us share our state's treasures with each of you. Until our next visit, I'm Ed Wurzbicki for Connecticut's Cultural Treasures. Funding for Connecticut's Cultural Treasures is provided by CPTV, Connecticut Tourism, the State Historic Preservation Office, Melinda and Paul Sullivan, People's United Bank, What Know How Can Do, and the following contributing sponsors.